Puppy. Mm-hmm. And connecting. This is that awkward thing at the beginning of every live stream where people are like, we going? We going? Are we going? Are we going? And when Laura Ann tweet, sends me messages in chat to see if I'll crack up on video. Nope. Just call you out. <laughs> All right. Why is this? The same thing happens at cons. It's just not the. Yeah. It's not online, right? We sit yeah. around at the panel table looking at each other like, okay. Shit like this is why Cat Richardson and I are not allowed to sit next to each other on panels anymore. <laughs> because we were heckling, uh, we were heckling one of the bigger named guests as they strolled in late to a panel. I'm just trying to make sure I've got all of our stuff approved. Everybody's background looks better than mine. I'm putting up my like fancy author background, but then I was like, eh. It's because you can't see the floor where everything's on it. Yeah. I moved most of the laundry out of the way. <laughs> I was got stinky fencing equipment. No. Well, yeah, but you have a cat like in the shot most of the time. So you're you good. Know, she's gone. I'm hoping she'll stay that way actually. <laughs> at some point during this, my cat will appear and you will believe that that loudmouth bastard has never been fed ever. And hello, Continual. This is, we are now live for our first session of the Panel Room Live, and I'm your host, Jim. I'm going to be turning it over now to our moderator for the day, John G. Hartness, as we have art and politics. Hey there, I'm John Hartness. I am the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, and I thought that this would be a good time in the world to pick a nice, calm topic with a group of not at all outspoken and opinionated guests so that we could have, you know, a cheerful, sunny discussion. Um, I will let my cheerful and sunny panelists introduce themselves. Let's start with the effervescent Laura Ann Gilman. I knew you were going to pick on me first. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Laura Ann Gilman. Um, former editor turned author because I was told that they were cookies. They didn't tell me I was going to have to cook them myself, bake them myself. Uh, author, among other things, the Devil's West series, the Retrievers uh, urban fantasy series, and forthcoming at some point from Saga, a uh, new novel, Huntsman. And who's that over there with the fencing equipment? I knew I was going to be next because I ended up sitting next to Lauren. That's the problem. So, my, you. <laughs> where's my cookies? So, uh, this is uh, Dale Muhammad. Uh, I, I actually figure I'm kind of the, the new kid in some ways. Um, so, my first ever solo novella came out last year, uh, which is The Labyrinth's Archivist from Falstaff Press. Um, I actually uh, 
uh, author, I can now say award-winning filmmaker, uh, and actually, which is probably most pertinent for this panel in some ways, is I've spent 15 years as a lobbyist, and then from there as a government uh, uh, exec. Uh, so worked in, on educational issues, uh, telecommunications, healthcare, and more re most recently, uh, employment. Hey, Michael, who are you? Michael G. Williams. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction. I wrote the Withrow Chronicles, and that's been published by Falstaff Books about basically monsters who live in suburbia. I, uh, which definitely doesn't have any politics in it. I wrote A Fallen Autumn, which is the first in a five book science fiction detective series about a far future society in which there's a lot of genetic engineering and what it's like to be a little bit different genetically, which is definitely not at all political. And I write Servant Sovereign, which is a novella series in the Shadow Council Archives universe about modern day witches who live in Tenderloin and San Francisco and have summoned up Emperor Norton to help them fight a demon of greed who's running a real estate scam, which is definitely not at all even remotely political. Uh, and outside of writing, I've been marching in queer pride parades and marches since 1992. And last but not least, the man with the hat, Gerald. Tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Gerald L. Coleman. Uh, I don't use my middle initial to be that guy, uh, but I use it so that when you go online, you know I'm not the professional soccer player or the Catholic priest <laughs> of the similar name. Uh, I write science fiction and fantasy and poetry um, and just glad to be here. You know, it's funny. I, I use my middle initial professionally also not to be that guy but because my father and I had the same first and last name, but different middle names. So I wanted to stop getting his credit card solicitations. And he <laughs> right. definitely wanted to stop getting my debt collectors calling <laughs> because he was not a writer. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's just start and we'll start in reverse order from our intro. So Gerald, you'll be first. What is your history personally as a writer with writing either political fiction or nonfiction or poetry. I know, Gerald, you've actually created some new poetry real recently. Yeah. Um, wow. For me, um, I, came to, I came to writing science fiction and fantasy a little differently. Uh, I've read it my entire life from the time I was a small child. Um, but I didn't really start writing myself uh, until high school, and that was initially poetry. And obviously, it was the kind of stereotypical thing where uh, I was writing little, you know, love poems to girls. You know, I'm trying to trying to be that guy in high school. Uh, but by the time I got to university. Uh, at the age of 18, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now, I had obviously experiences as a young black man in this country, uh, but I had never thought about writing in that vein. But once I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, which led to, I mean, I was a philosophy major, so I was reading, I was reading um, Derrida and, and Kant and all the rest of that, but I started reading Frederick Douglass and uh, Carter G. Woodson, and, you know, that led to W.B. Du Bois, and on and on. And for me, that immediately uh, reoriented my writing to writing about my experience and the, the experiences of my community uh, in my poetry. So ultimately, when I finally got around to, to writing science fiction and fantasy, uh, it was going to be political just because of who I am, not because you sit down with an, a quote unquote agenda to create something, but when you're writing because you're writing from your, from your personal point of view, your perspective and your experiences, it, it, you know, you bring that to the genre. So, you know, it's going to be inherently uh, political. So that's kind of how I kind of made my way to writing science fiction and fantasy and why it is, you know, almost unavoidably 
uh, political. Now, that doesn't mean that it hits you over the top of the head and preaches to you, but it does mean that it, the, its overarching themes and, and the experiences of the characters are in line with those, with those experiences. Um, and, and I mean, the interesting thing to me is that it, it's all, all of it, um, well, not all of it, but, you know, the vast majority of the stuff that I read leading up to becoming a writer had that same, had that same tone and that same kind of context about it. Um, even though it was written from from other communities and other perspectives, so that's 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 kind of how. Michael, what about you? I think the very first thing I wrote that was like very consciously political was in eighth grade in Mrs. McGee's language arts class, and I. Uh, we had a, we were doing an in-class short story contest, basically, and I wrote a short story about a governor of a southern state who takes a big campaign donation from a renowned racist and then turns around and uses it to promote an anti-racist uh, platform and winds up assassinated for it. And and wow. as an eighth grader, I was like trying to talk about like I think about like the the hypocrisy and the, the like open threat of violence that I perceived in the world around me um, from people who sort of knew that their power over the lives of me and everybody around me was sufficiently complete that they could make us do theoretically whatever they wanted. In my case, it was like religious power and family dynamics and things like that. But I was like trying to get that out in some way that I like my eighth grade head could get around and uh and then when i started writing books you know in like my 30s everything was explicitly overwhelmingly political i had been a political columnist for a queer publication at the university that i attended and i had uh done a lot of really political blogging in the early 2000s and stuff like that and when it came to writing fiction there was absolutely no way you know much like you said like the, the, because of who i am there was no way that I was going to be writing fiction that wasn't political. Any time we set out to tell a story, we are to some degree describing the world as we think it is based on our experience or as we think it should be, or as we're afraid that it will become, we're depicting what we consider truths about the world. And that's just sort of inherently always going to be political. Dave, what about you? So I actually was thinking about that a little bit, and, the, and I think part of it comes down to uh, and where some of the arguments start is around the definition of what is political. Um, and I think a lot of the accusations of making work political is is for when when folks see something that maybe disagrees with their worldview. And I think that's where, where Michael hit it on itself. The idea of politics as a whole is not as narrow as, as Democratic, Republican, conservative, liberal. That, that's such a narrow definition because if you think about it, what we're talking about, um, politics is the idea of not just a form of governing, it's something that's about the idea of power, uh, definitions of power and systems, uh, and that impacts economics, impacts culture, impacts uh, societal systems, um, and it impacts our expectations of what the world should look like, right? So in that respect, anything that anybody writes is going to be to some extent political because it's written based on their worldview. So when I pick up a book and all the characters are white, it's based on the person who wrote its worldview because that's all they see, whether that is accurate or not. Um, so my argument would be, well, yes, of course I've written political because I think everything is um, because I do believe in that much broader definition. If we want to talk about uh, things that are much more overtly political, um, which I'm, I'm not sure I, I like the idea of distinguishing them because then it makes it, people feel it's easier to draw a line because you can't, because otherwise you could simply say, um, how about this, any book with a queer character is political, but if it, if it doesn't have a queer character, it's not political. And then, then that's, not, that's not where we want things to be. I'd rather just simply acknowledge that everything is political because it impacts everything. So, uh, so I think I sort of sidestepped your question, but at the same time, I think I want to hammer home that point that 
if you're reading something and you go, that's not political, you need to take another look at the way the world is depicted in that story. And maybe at yourself as well. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> I'm trying to be gentle here and I'm trying I'm to. <laughs> to... <laughs> yeah, gentle yeah, is not my brand. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it is hard. It's, it's, we've been, we have been fed a, um, I love, we've been fed a lie about what the world looks like and what it should be. And it is a beautiful lie. And it's very hard to let go of that because of the cognitive dissonance associated with that. Um, and I have, an, I have an easy example, actually. It's one of my favorite ones. Uh, uh, Law and Order TV series, Law and Order SVU and all the spinoffs for how many years now. And that has taught us this is what law enforcement and the AG and them look like. Good guys go after bad guys. They don't show anybody taking brides, overstepping, or if they do it is promptly corrected with an episode or two right okay. so we minutes. right so we have this image of that's what it is but without recognition of all right let's talk about people people are never perfect and when you have systems that are built on on um imperfect balances of power and and ideas of 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 inherent racism and and, and misogyny and things like that within it it's going to impact those folks in power too which means guess what how many of those folks arrested really uh, didn't deserve it. The fact that 80% of real life, 80% of people plead out before it ever goes to court. I don't think 80% of the people arrested actually maybe did that crime. They're going to plead out because dear God, they don't want to go because we have this assumption. If you're arrested, you must have done something wrong or isn't there more to the story? That's that's the vicious thing that I hate. Isn't there more to the story? Are we missing something? And that is what Law and Order SVU has taught us. It, it has created this expectation. And it's a perfect example of how art, which someone may not have thought of as political, has actually become political just by its mere presence. Okay, that was a long rant. I'm going to stop now. That's okay. <laughs> no points for that one now. <clears throat> it was a good rant. And while you were ranting, we got to watch what looked like the same cat walk across Laura Ann's lap and end up behind you. <laughs> Different cats. We hope. Two cats, a couple thousand miles between them. That's a long cat. <laughs> Laura Ann, have you ever, I don't know, do you have any experience writing anything that's at all political? Um, uh, first, I want to say what Day said. Uh, yes. Yeah. She's completely correct in that there is nothing in our worldview that is not in some way or another political because politics informs the world. I was raised, I, I joke that I was raised by, um, or ha was helped to be raised by a pack of semi-feral social workers because of where my mom worked. Um, and I grew up in the eighties because I am an old, uh, hearing about Soviet dissidents and refuseniks and working with uh, Soviet citizens who were resettled in the U.S. So from the time I was a preteen, I knew that what happened to artists under repressive and fascist regimes. And I knew that there were people who used their art to fight it. This has always been a part of my worldview. This has always been, in a way, my sense of what art is not required to do, but should do. It, it needs to poke at the world. It needs to ask questions. If you can do that while entertaining, so much the better. Um, but I do believe that the artist has an obligation to raise questions about the world around them, whatever your art is. Um, as to whether I've ever written anything overtly political, um, no. I try not to be overt about anything except um, my own personal opinions. But my very first series, uh, the Retriever series, was urban fantasy set in a world, um, they were originally published in 2004, currently being reissued by Fairy Cat Press, small commercial there. But they were about a city being uh, torn apart by prejudice and power imbalances within the, the magical community um, in a, a alternate world, New York City. Um, so I pretty much was there right out of the gate, I guess, in that, that the six book series was about people stepping up or not stepping up, taking responsibility, um, forming coalitions, even when they didn't necessarily have that much in common because they knew that they were heading towards, if not a similar goal, they wanted to avoid a, a, a particular fate. Um, because to me, that's life. 
That's what I was writing about. The political aspects of it cannot be extricated from characters actually living. And every, every book I've written, every series I've written has had that at its core, which is I'm writing about a world. I'm writing about people's lives. And there is no world and there is no life that politics does. Politics in its broader sense, as Day said, does not affect. So once again, I kind of answered the question by sidestepping it, I think. <laughs> but I think that both of you, uh, both of you addressed part of the bigger question which it digs into what is politics, what is political, because I, stunner, I agree with you that um, everything is political because politic, politics shapes our worldview and our worldview our, and our worldview shapes our work. When was, what was the first thing you read that was your aha moment of, oh, this is a political work, whether it was overt or not. For me personally, the first science fiction book I ever read was an aha, oh wait, this is political. And it was um, Have Space Suit Will Travel. Um, Heinlein's juveniles were, pretty much all of them were overtly political. And that was the first sci-fi book I ever read. So my exposure to the genre started with politics. And Michael, we'll start with you this time. Uh, I, I'm i debating which, I'm gonna name two books. <laughs> um, uh, the, one, the first one that I realized, oh, there's more to this than what is on the surface was actually Dracula which is a very political novel in a lot of ways. And, uh, and there's, not all of its politics are great, but some of its politics are great. And especially around things like uh, making sure that Mina's opinions are valued by everyone else on the team. That she's a spend a part of the novel saying, oh, we have to protect her because she's a lady. And then eventually they realize, no, she has these really valuable ideas and insights and she has a perspective that we do not have as the dudes who have been chasing Dracula around England. And so we need her on the team. We need to diversify our set of opinions and perspectives in order to succeed here. And I realized when reading it in like sixth or seventh grade that this was partly him explicitly saying like, you have to have more perspectives than your own and you have to value the opinions of women in order to be successful in the new era because the old era will otherwise like consume and destroy us. Um, but the first book that I, while reading it was like, oh, somebody wrote this to be political was Fahrenheit 451. And reading that, I was like, oh, this is not just a book about how great books are. This is a book about like the way that the world can be awful and terrifying and the way that like being taken care of all the time is its own uh being distracted from from the power of art is its own sort of danger i wish that whoever came up with reality television would have gone and read fahrenheit 451. they were probably assigned it in school but they read the cliff notes they probably were you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, like, whenever we talk about what is political and, and what makes a work political and things like that, every person's politics ultimately boil down to the set of things in their life that they wish they had or that they would defend because they have it. You know, and, like, that becomes the foundation of any person's politics. And so any story in which something matters is ultimately a political story to some degree or another. And anybody who says this work isn't political, is probably saying that because that work describes a worldview that they agree with and an experience that matches their own. And they're just not self-aware enough to realize that. Gerald, what about you? Wow, I'm thinking, and um, I was born in 68. So elementary school for me was uh, mid to late seventies and then on into the early eighties. Right. So, so for me, the X-Men immediately, like no question. I know this, I, I identified immediately with the mutants. Cause I'm like, yes, this is my story. You're, you're talking about my story. And I think the genius of that is that any marginalized group of people 
can identify with them in the in the context of that story. Simultaneously, I'm reading um, through the wonderful experience of the Scholastic Book Fair, uh, Watership Down and Rats of Nim, uh, which for me, again, okay, I can clearly see the lines in these stories, um, whether it's oppression or, uh, or fascism, um, you know, I can clearly see this stuff. And then at, at the age of nine, Star Wars, when it first opens. So, you know, I, I had that, that whole little er era that, that I had these, all of these formative experiences with, with, uh, with fiction, whether it was in the form of comics or novels or film. Uh, and television that were, were clearly all kind of, you know, giving a message that was very clearly political. Uh, not necessarily, as we were saying earlier, overhanded like a sledgehammer on top of your head, but very clearly political in that these are the lines that are being drawn um, about what's going on with the protagonist. And for me early on, that really set the tone for me about what the, what the story arc should be. And that's, that's just for me in terms of my experience of reading in terms of what I was looking for. Now, obviously there's, there's stuff out there where the, where the writers are, are trying to get at some different, uh, some different angle in what they do with their protagonists. Uh, but for me, that clearly kind of set the standard for what I was looking for as a as a reader uh, in in uh, in my protagonists and in the and in the plots and in the, the storylines. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of but but cl very clearly that the the one the one early kind of of uh, story that I read that I immediately the bells went off that this is political was the X Men between the X-Men and Star Wars, by the time you hit sixth grade, you were already a revolutionary. Man, you know? <laughs> you, were, you were never, ever going to sit quietly. And, and I'm a second generation Trek fan. I came to Star Trek through my mother. And uh, to this day, we go see all of the Star Trek films together. But, you know, I watched the original series with her. Uh, and that was nothing but anyone who says the original Star Trek was not political was was either on drugs or asleep while, while the show was was on. I mean, you know, I I clearly remember uh, the episode and I'm, I'm, I can't remember the, the title of the, the episode, but where the aliens are black on one side and white on the other. Yeah. And, and, you know, Kirk and them are like, well, what's, what's the problem? Well, he's white on the left side and I'm black on the left. And it's like, are you serious? Like, are you serious? And so, yeah, yeah, for me, it was just really in, in the very water of what I was consuming in terms of, of, um, of comics, novels, TV, and film. So, yeah, like you said, John, I, I guess I didn't have any other alternative. <laughs> I would love to hear sometime from your mom what it was like to the first time she saw Uhura. <laughs> right. Right. I've heard that from some other women who were already grown and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, there are actually black people in the future. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that I think as a kid watching that, that that immediately kind of subconsciously told me to relax while I was watching it. That was the, that was the that was the virtue signal that said, OK, you. Because a lot of times, you know, black folk go into something with your, you go into it with your, with your hands up. Like, okay, let me, I mean, and that's everything, whether it's going to a con for the first time or uh, starting to watch a new show or going to a film, you go in with your guard up because you, okay, so, because what is this going to be? Is this going to be something that I have to protect my emotional self from? Or is this something that I can actually like kind of put my fist down and relax 
and enjoy. Uh, and I think for me watching Star Trek, when I saw when I saw her on screen, that immediately, even as a kid, allowed me to kind of, OK, I can relax. You know, so and, and that's not to say that just because you cast a person of color in your show, that that, that your show is going to automatically be something worth watching. But at that time and given kind of what the other themes were, uh, I have a lot of respect for Gene Roddenberry and his vision for that show. Uh, that really kind of allowed me to kind of relax. I, I immediately relaxed when I saw her on the screen. Cool. Laura Ann? Um, originally, I was going to say, yeah, the Heinlein young adult novels um, were kind of my first introduction. But the truth is, I have two sisters who are five and six years older than me, and we shared a bathroom growing up, and they would leave whatever they were reading for school in the bathroom, as one does. Uh, so for me, I think the first book that really kind of kicked my my brain over and said, oh, that's what's going on here was Flowers for Algernon, um, which isn't per se political politics, but it's definitely medical politics. It was social politics. It was power politics. Yeah. And it made no apologies for what it was doing. It wasn't pretending. It wasn't saying this is an adventure novel. It wasn't saying this is, you know, science fiction novel. It was saying this is a novel about interpersonal, medical, all, all this stuff, all the political elements of power. And I probably read it too too early um, to really get all of it, but it's one of the few books that I have never been able to get out of my head. Um, and the emotions and the concerns and the confusion that I had reading it, like what, what, why? Probably the first book I ever had to ask why, um, which to me means it was a successful book. Uh, just incredibly powerful by refusing to blink. I always wondered how my fifth grade teacher, Miss Blakeman, got away with assigning that book to us. Because I remember, it, uh, uh, Laura, and I remember those emotions that you're yeah. talking about as you're reading through that story. Uh, and you're it's talking really, about brilliant book. 11, 11, 12 years old reading that. Yeah, that does something to you. Yeah, I was reading it when I was about nine, literally. <laughs> yeah, I think I was probably fifth or sixth grade when I read it, too. And uh, and yeah, thinking back to growing up in very rural South Carolina, how the hell did they get away with assigning that? Speaking on behalf of very rural North Carolina, they got away with it because nobody's parents were paying attention. <laughs> True enough. Day, what about you and Kitty? Where was y'all's first? Uh... Um, I'm actually thinking about it. I, I actually had more that was uh, political that was not science fiction, I think, early on. Um, because I was I was looking at because it, it was like um, Aikwe Arma's uh, "The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born" was one that I got in school, uh, but I was I was so like right there with Gerald because the first one that was a selection of my own was the Claremont era X Men uh, and and the the expansion of the role of Aurora Monroe and and yes uh, you know she's she you know a woman who is seen as an African goddess and then seeing her in this role and expanding to take over um, a team of the X-Men at the time and as a as a as a little Arab girl I'm like look look somebody who looks like me um, but it's one of the things where I got to see the the dynamics and and what it meant uh, to her and the view of her compared to some of the the, the male characters but the other characters uh, who were white um, so that was I realized that was one of the, the first big ones the one the other if it were talking about a science fiction book but but I will say that was I was like, oh, excellent. You got it. Because that was that was definitely my first one was the the Claremont era um, is actually uh, The Handmaid's Tale. And it's been actually one of my mm. um, favorite books for a very, very long time uh, because the, the way it melds um, the, 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 the personal impact of, of policy and politics on, on an individual and what that means. Um, and, and so seeing it actually made it to a, a TV series with author input 
uh, actually is really uh, interesting. And then read, watching it and rereading it as an adult, uh, you also start to see some of the cracks in the way it was built and that how even on its own where it's trying to address um, and look at some of the problems with policy and politics and power where it's leaving out other pieces of that and it's ignored them in the focus of one area. And no, we can't be all things to all people, but also recognizing um, the, the, imper uh, the imperfect um, perspective. So I think that um, my next question originally was going to be, does politics have a place in fiction? And I think you guys have all answered that yes. with a resounding yes, that, um, that not only does it have a place in it, that it's inescapable, but let's talk about it from a professional as a writer standpoint do you think writers should espouse their political views on social media? And if not, why not? And Gerald, I want to start with you. Uh, <clears throat> you know what? I, I thought about the, I thought about that question when you first broached it at the beginning uh, before we went live. And I thought I think that I think the kind of fundamental question beneath your question is. Should should we be our, our our authentic selves on social media? And my question, my answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, I know that there is a there is a school of thought that says that you separate those two, the the business side from your private side, and that you end up with these very vanilla social media pages where. Uh, the person tries their best not to offend anyone. Um, that to me is is not only inauthentic, but it's boring. Uh, I think you should be who you are. And then I think you should be willing to accept the consequences of who you are. And uh, I, I think that you do yourself and the people who, who, who love your work a disservice by not being your authentic self. Uh, and I think, uh, I think John, you posted something uh, about that earlier today uh, about uh, the, 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 the level of disappointment in a fan who finds out you haven't been your authentic self can be more damaging than someone who just doesn't upfront outright agree with your position on any particular issue. Uh, I think those are two different, two different levels of disappointment. I can say, okay, well, number one, I don't agree with that. So maybe I won't buy your work. But the sense of betrayal that comes from me having followed your work for years, only to find out that you don't believe I am a, am, am a human being deserving of of dignity and all the, the rights therein, that kind of disappointment can be a hundred times more damaging to your brand, since folks are so concerned about that, than the, than the disappointment in someone finding out upfront initially and immediately that this is who you are, this is what you stand for, this is what you believe in. And then that gives them the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to support your, your work. I think that's a much better approach than you harboring this notion about people that you hide away, right? So that they can buy your book and then uh, seven years down the line, they find out, oh, that's who you are? This is, this is who you are? Oh, wow. Could I get my money back? Well, obviously I can't, but uh, I think that I think that represents a greater threat to you as a business person, and and for me it comes down to being being the authentic person. I want to know who you are because what you, one of the things that I found out in in selling my work at at um, particularly at conventions, the reason that my work sells better is because I'm there behind the table and they get to see who I am, and people are, are very often. As much as they are buying your book, they're buying you. They want to know that the person that they're buying something from is someone that they like. 
at some level. Uh, and so I, I think, I think yes, I think you owe it to yourself. And I think you owe it to the people who, who, who love and support your work to be your authentic self. Now, Day, you're, you've had multiple careers now involving politics. Um, obviously, your political lobbying career had one set of rules and one set of acceptable behaviors, but what do you think? So um, I actually think the the best thing is to be upfront, right? Um, and I think there is some truth to that in, in, in lobbying the idea, and this is a great example here, in lobbying the idea is I want to put forward a specific policy, right? Uh, and the policy can, can be about anything. Uh, I had one about um, with regard to immigrants seeking asylum. And... And this is where the idea of that larger definition of what is 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 political is much better than the narrow definition, because the idea of of let's talk about the idea of if someone is being tormented in their country and they're they they need respite here, right? And that's what they're seeking. Then just going to one political party is not going to help gain support for those folks. It's not going to do anything. And the thing is, you can find support in the most unusual places. One of the biggest supporters um, of 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 legislation on that I learned was actually a Republican. Um, I'm going to blank on what state he is, and it was actually a relatively conservative state. Why? Because there were a lot of immigrants within his community who had contributed to the community, um, and so he was very much in favor, especially of supporting asylum seekers. And that was that was the narrow band that made it okay for him. But the idea was we would not have been able to do as much. Um, by cutting people off, because it's not about the label, it's about what what uh, is of interest and what actually they're putting forward. And that's where that authentic authenticity and genuineness comes from. So for that individual, as far as being authentic to himself, it was it, it was him connecting to his community, which included immigrants who were also asylum seekers. And so that allowed us to be able to do that. Um, on a personal level, people can be uh, much, I can be much stronger about my opinions. Um, and I think the thing is over time, especially with social media, we're seeing this blurring of what is professional and personal, right? We're seeing folks with a single account. We're seeing the idea of this is who you are as a part of that. And in, in a way to respond to that, if you if we don't have that separation anymore, which more and more, we're just not seeing it. The rise of influencers actually is a great example of that, of that because the personal is the professional, right? Um, then it makes more sense to put out what is actually there. When making film, they always ask, what's your audience? Nobody says, I want to make a film for the whole world. You're required to narrow it down to specific demographics that you're aiming for because that's what's really there. And I, and I think in some ways, um, the publishing industry never quite got the memo to some of that going, you guys need to be a little more targeted in some of that. And I think that is becoming more and more true. Um, the other reason that I'm, I would advocate for being much more open on that front is, um, one, you don't want a sterile you don't want a sterile impression of you. It, it makes you, it does, it makes you sterile. You're a little too clean, there's nothing there. But the other thing is when you're writing, right? We're spending how many hours of our day? This is our life we're spending on this. And then um, to shut away parts of it. So there'll be things you write about that you are excited about and you should be able to share that. And I think some of that is going to be deemed political. Um, I I love this, the, the, the series, uh, Winona Earp, right? And the uh, I still remember one of the writers on their time but I was so excited. We had this massive fight scene. And later we looked at it. It was a three-woman fight scene. It was a fight scene that was all women. And it turned out to be amazing. And we and and the idea of putting it together, they were able to share something that somebody else might deem kind of political. But at the same time, they got to share that with an audience that was appreciative. Um, and the reason that show has continued to go on, because it doesn't have a huge um, audience, it has a very niche audience, was because of the passion and the fanaticism I guess you could say of that 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 kind of um, audience and fanscape I'm like it was the passion of fans that kept Star Trek online so by embracing your political you actually can be strengthening your brand in many ways I think people get caught up in using it as a negative um, and she doesn't know this so I'm going to go ahead and say it so it was what and I, it was the Retriever series was the first I read of Lauren Gilman and then I hunted her up online and I'm like <laughs> hey look her social media is all about books wine cats and politics and I'm like Hey, this is kind of cool. There's things that we have in common. I like this.
about 30 seconds where she signed my book. Was it twice? Okay. More than once. And that was it. Um, but that's, that was, that was just enough to make a connection as a fan and as a reader. Right. So now it's like whoosh, more than 10 years later. And I'm like, look, look, I'm on a panel with her. I'm so excited. <gasps> okay. <laughs> fan moment over, but, <laughs> but it, it is an example there very directly and obviously very personal of how the political added to the picture of who the author was. And I'm like, not the whole picture, but because by God, if the, if it was just politics all the time, I'm like, well, that's not that interesting either. Right. Um, but it gives a better picture of who the author is. And isn't that what you want for your fans and for your audiences? You want them to give as full a picture of you and of your work and being able to share that. And the more you cut away of yourself out of that, the less a whole picture that is. And that's not as interesting, not as fulfilling. Um, and you're not as likely to get those, those, um, those, I don't want to say rabbit, those fans who are like, I want what's theirs. Um, and we've seen that with those, those actually those two television series are a great example of what has kept them going. And I imagine there are authors who can say the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and some of that to me ties back to something Gerald said. When I was in sales and sales management, I would tell people, people buy things from people they like. So don't be a dick. Now, obviously, I haven't always taken that to heart. But anyway, so Lauren, now that you've been fangirled over. Um... I want to say first, it's twice because at one point I, we were in the same convention bar together and you had your then guide dog together with, with you and I, I fangirled over your guide dog. So, you know, mutual thing. Um, first, I want to preface by saying that, yes, I do believe that people should be open if they feel comfortable and safe doing so. Because not everybody can, not everybody does. Um, and that needs to be respected. There are a number of people, either because of family situations or they're, where they're living, that they do not feel safe. And if that's your situation, then you've got to work with it. Safety, you have to, you have to protect yourself first. Uh, that said, I don't think, especially in, uh, I feel strongly about this, you can tell because I'm talking with my hands again. I do not feel that, especially in modern social media, it is a good thing to hide any part of yourself that is important to you. Um, you're stifling yourself. Uh, as Day said, that makes a very boring uh, presentation you there's a whole thing about how you're only supposed to do like 20 or 30 percent self-promotion on social media and everything else has to be something else well a lot of that something else is going to be politics if that's what's concerning you uh if that's what you're involved in uh personally yesterday i was part of the seattle frontline protests and absolutely i came home and i'm like okay this happened this happened this happened I was there, I was eyewitness to this. As a historian, it was important for me to say that, but also as somebody who's caught up in the world around me. If I hadn't said something about that, to me, it would have been a betrayal of trust of who I am, but also what I feel I owe the world. And being a three-dimensional uh, person in social media is part of what creates that trust between creator and consumer, reader and writer that they can say, okay, I know who this person is. Um, I know kind of where they're going. I can, going back to the question of trust in a book, I can trust that they're not going to suddenly yank uh, the carpet out from under me and hurt me. Conversely, uh, if somebody comes in and reads my feed and is like, you know, unhappy with my politics, they're probably not gonna like my books either. And honestly, if they hold hurtful policies, I can do without their money. You know, I would rather not be writing for those people if they are going to be harmful. Uh, so it's kind of like open, you know, full disclaimer, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what I believe, this is pretty much what I write. And I think that kind of honesty definitely does build a connection. And, it's, and that connection is important, yeah. I saw somebody post something over the past week that there are two kinds of authors that you're gonna find who are active on social media. 
There's the ones who sell 10 million books a year and they're not going to notice if you don't buy their books or the ones that sell a thousand books a year and you're not going to bankrupt them either. So I think that people should absolutely vote with their wallets. And yeah, if they don't like, if they don't like my Twitter feed, they sure aren't going to like my books <laughs> because I swear more in my books than I do on Twitter. And that's a lot. <laughs> Michael, I I think it's uh, I think that every time we write a book, every time we create art, every time we say to somebody, "Hey, here are some ideas. I want to put ideas that were in my brain into your brain." Um, mm. To some degree, we owe those people an explanation of why they should be paying attention to our ideas in the first place. Um, I think that it's not just good to be openly political as creators. I think we kind of, within the bounds of safety, I think is a very important caveat to this. But I think that to some degree, we owe it to them to explain where the ideas that we're trying to literally sell them came from and why we think those things are important and why we want to share those ideas with them, why we want to shape the way that they think about the world so that in their life, they will try to make the world more like that. Uh, every word we put on the page is a choice. Every word that we leave off of the work page is a choice. Every character that we cast, every story that we tell, every plot that we write, every resolution that we have, every happy ending, every unhappy ending, everything about it is a choice. And there is a reason behind those choices. And we may not always realize in the moment the reason why we made that choice. But I guarantee that somebody who reads the book is going to ask, why did they make that choice? But I think that to some degree, we owe them an answer. Um, I also think that readers or viewers or you know, whatever consumer of the art we make, uh, whatever role they are, um, if we pointedly don't, you know, if we pointedly try to hide our politics or pointedly try to omit discussion of that in our public persona, that is just as noticeable, if not more so, than simply participating in the natural political conversations that are happening around us. If I, as a writer, saw protests happening in the street against police violence and police brutality against people of color, and my response to that were to say, uh, there's a 10% discount on my books this week and the weather is great, then I am making a political statement. I may tell myself that I'm not, but I am making a political statement that ultimately boils down to all this stuff that's happening in your life doesn't matter to me or doesn't affect me. You know, And so it is, it is very important, I think, that we recognize that we are not just having this one-way transmission of information from our book to our reader, but we are part of a conversation that that reader is having with us and we are a part of the world that that reader is in and we are a part of the life and the society that that reader must also endure. And it is important, if nothing else, that we tell them that they are not alone in this. And it's important if we want them to do something about the world that we tell them what that is and why. I, you know, I think that that's part of this conversation is 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 due to the fact that the that the zeitgeist has changed the la the last twenty years because for a long time there was this um, this ideology that you could separate the art from the artist right that that somehow or other the art existed in this nebulous space uh, disconnected from the artist and that the artist could be this deeply problematic person. But you, you, you didn't worry about that. You just kind of compartmentalize that and just consume the art in and of itself. And I think the zeitgeist has changed that people aren't, people aren't interested in that, in that uh, compartmentalization anymore. They want to know that, that the artist is, uh, is not problematic and that because, because you're spending your money, right? And who wants to, who wants to, who wants to buy Hitler a cup of coffee, right? You don't want to contribute to that person and that problematic position or positions that that person takes. And so I think this, this kind of notion that that wall used to exist and people accepted it, I think that wall is crumbling if it hasn't completely crumbled altogether and that you can't just separate the art from the artist anymore. 
And I think that as, as readers, we don't want to give those people more real estate inside our own brains. Literally 10 minutes before this panel, my husband and I were talking about how glad I am that I never got that Ravenclaw tattoo that I've thought about. You know, like, I don't want to, I don't want to give more of my life to her now. You know, so I, I feel like to some degree, we, we owe it to them to know what they're getting into if they decide to invest emotional energy in our work. I would actually disagree a little bit in that, in that there are people who do still want to compartmentalize. They don't want to know anything about, and that is their right. All they have to do is stay off social media. <clears throat> um, you know, it, nobody is forcing you to follow an author. Nobody's forcing you to interact with them outside the pages of the book. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are just kind of like, yeah, no, I just I just want to read the book. I just want to enjoy. And I'm not going to say to them, you must be socially aware. You must be politically aware because that's going to backfire. Um, but they don't have to. People who want to do deserve an honest answer. Uh, yeah, I think my point is that that was a dogma, though. That used to be a, 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 a hard and fast dogma that you separate the art from the artist. That not, not, a, not that that's an individual or personal choice, but that, that, the, that the systems were in place that said you don't drag whatever the author's thing is into uh, in the, the artist's thing into that art. I think that's been a, a, a real kind of strong dogma. And I think that that's changed. In well, the it's, last it's changed 20. because of social media. Before publishers had control, more, much more control over the persona that publisher that, that authors had, they were the ones doing tours. They were, you know, they were the ones controlling the picture. They controlled the vertical. They controlled the horizontal. They controlled the paycheck. Um, social media completely changed that. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it, I would say even in the past ten years, really. But even before then, there were writers who were unapologetically political uh, and made that choice to have that, that side of them be known. And some who just were like, you know, no, I don't want to interact with the outside world at all. Leave me the hell alone. So I think it's just the, the means of transmission that has changed rather than the mentality. So that segues nicely into my next question, and we're going to start it with Lauren. <laughs> but I'll give you a little. I'll give. I'll give you a lead in. Um, sometimes there are consequences for authors in being political. Um, for myself, I was let go of a let go from a job because the owner's wife read one of my books and decided that I wasn't Christian enough to represent their company anymore. I failed to mention that I don't identify as Christian at all. So I never was, but they also didn't ask. But they read my first book and decided that, yeah, no, nobody with, nobody who's questioning religion should be a part of our company. So I was fired for that and whatever. I'm in a way better place now made for a rough couple of months, but I was also really happy to not work there anymore. But Lauren, you were part of the big machine for a while. So when you were, what have you seen? What did New York do when you were there? Uh, yeah, I was a New York editor for 16 years, the last seven of those heading uh, the Rock Science Fiction imprint. And yeah, when you're part of the corporate machine, you do have a certain responsibility to your public persona um, in that you are not to embarrass your publisher. You are not to embarrass your boss or not to. Um, fortunately for publishing that generally did not involve politics. It was more about, please God, don't get arrested. Uh, <laughs> um, but you do have to be a little more aware of how things will be taken, not because you're not allowed to have opinions, but because you are standing as a representative of the company and it might be seen as the company taking a stance. I certainly became much more vocal on my own when I went freelance. Uh, not that I was demure or you know retiring beforehand before anybody starts laughing. 
so for 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 me for me they're really uh, one of my former bosses was a was a former social worker um in new york city so we had a lot of a lot of leeway a lot of good discussions for writers i don't remember a time anyone has ever censured for behavior pro or con uh, whichever side of of the aisle they fell upon I do know that there were a lot of sales meetings where there were some heavy sighs uttered and a general feeling of, we're not really as enthusiastic about this person as we could have been. And that's not necessarily even about politics. There was a big name non-author who was doing a big name nonfiction book with the publisher uh, who had all the right politics. Everybody was really gung-ho. And then it turned out this person was um, a shit and made an editorial assistant cry, which is the one, one strict rule of, edit, of publishing, by the way, you never make the assistants cry because everybody will hate you. And immediately overnight, the entire mood of, of the project changed. So no, it's, it's not anything where somebody's gonna say, well, I'm never gonna publish you again, unless you're being published by say a house that has a very conservative or liberal feel and you come out the opposite, but you knew that going in. It's more a question of people are maybe not going to give 100% anymore because they just don't feel the passion. Uh, they'll do their job, but they're not going to do anything more than that. So on the on the professional corporate or, or, or employer side, yeah, that's, that is very much a risk. Mostly your editor knows who you are when they acquire the book, though. I worked with a great many of authors whom I completely disagree with politically, and we had some rousing arguments, but we worked together fine. That was not an issue. I supported the books because I believed in them. As a writer, like I said, I pretty much was out of the gate who I was. And I know that there are a lot of people who refuse to read my books um, simply because of who I am. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I accept that as a consequence. Um, it is what it is. Gerald? I, I really don't concern myself with it, mostly because um, I don't have an opportunity to, to make a decision about how people perceive me. Uh, people look at you as a black person and immediately out of the gate, there are this, there's this whole host of presumptions that are there. And you don't get to decide whether or not people know you're black Right. I can't I can't go home and take it off like this hat. Uh, it's immediately perceptive. I don't have to do anything or act in a certain way. People immediately it's on. It's, it's right there in front of them. So I don't get to make that choice. So for me, it, 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 it has always been. Well, I mean, these things are going these decisions are going to be made uh, whether I play into them or not. So I'm just going to be who I am. And uh, that 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 I, I think in some level that's the same reason why when I when I write I uh, make sure that the covers of my books have black characters on them. Um, I want that image to be there, and um, and I'm willing to um, to. Do uh, a grimy corner of fandom that doesn't uh, want even want me to be in the genre. Uh, th th I, I don't want their money. So I'm, I'm uh, I think you, you kind of, you have to become comfortable with that because you don't have an op an option. People see your picture in the uh, guest section of the con guests and they don't, I, I, there's no way for me to negotiate that. They see clearly who I am, and immediately uh, that's something that I, I just have to deal with. Day, what about you? I'm trying to remember what the original question was. Oh, God, me too. <laughs> um, consequences for your political well, Yeah. So um, I have a lot of thoughts swirling around, and I think they're all a little. Um, muddled, so please 
uh, bear with me, I think. So for a long time, as part of my day job, the political, the, at least as far as our, that narrow definition of politics, uh, it was important to not have that there because I ended up having to work with everybody. Why? Because remember I said the idea, the idea of the uh, immigration issues and depending on who you get, where the policy lands. Um, and so some of that uh, was very much choked off because the importance was the idea of, of the policy and the issue at hand. And, and it's amazing where you can find allies. And the idea was to go for that. I think over time, uh, I think it's become more important to me to go, well, this is actually what I think separate from that part of it. And that's where the idea of there's working with folks and then there's they're, they're saying, this is where I stand. Um, and I, I think um, you see a lot of that within civil service, right? Um, I, I currently work for the government. It's one among many of my jobs over the years, and I've worked with very, very many people. Uh, and administrations, let's narrow definition of politics, come and go. But at the end of the day, um, the people I work with, um, you know, our job is to represent and work for the American people. We're supposed to be doing things that are supposed to be making the country better. And that is our commitment. That is an, you know, um, that is an oath we swore, actually, as a part of that. Um, and so as far as the non-political um, civil service, uh, there are a lot of folks who really want to do that. Um, and we've been, I know several folks have asked, well, why don't you quit? This administration is doing terrible things. Why don't you quit? Or this job or this person, why don't you quit that person or buying from that author? And I think it comes down to some of that is individual choice. Some people can take a job, can leave a job and go to a different job. Some people can decide who can decide. I Not only do I not want to buy from that author, I'm going to encourage other people not to buy from that author because they feel so strongly. And it's figuring out where you feel along that spectrum and what kinds of actions you want to take as a part of that. Uh, I know um, I will probably re remain in, 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 with, in civil service and I know other people who have. Why? Because as, as many of them said, they took that oath to protect the American people. And that's why they want they choose to stay no matter what. Um, and then and other people, folks say you, you should leave. So do you see how I many it comes down to where you fit in that? Now, the, the question related to this that I that I interests me very much and I think is an important part of that is is when you make a conscious decision for some of these things and when are, there are things that you might end up doing unconsciously. And I have a, a very a uh, good example of this as, as it relates to some of that. So I remember meeting someone for the very, very first time. And I said, you can't miss me. I'm the one with the guide dog. Um, and we'd met because it was a, a, a political podcast and things that I used to do. Um, and she goes, really? She didn't know that because there was absolutely nothing on my website or social media that said I was blind. And it took me a moment to go, holy crap, without meaning to, I completely censored that part of my life out. Um, and so that's where I go. There are times we actually, and some of it, you know, people have done for safety, but unconsciously I had erased that part of me. Um, my bio currently says, you know, um, it, it has all the writing based stuff and the filmmaking stuff, but at the bottom says she currently lives in Washington, DC uh, with her wife and our Brown, uh, you know, uh, a guide dog and two really bad cats. And that was a throwaway line for me in my bio. And I still remember somebody who, who had actually written a very lovely article about me who talked about how excited they were to see that I had a wife um, and, and how important that was for them. And I think that was the, um, and that, like I said, throwaway. And that was the moment where I realized I need to be very specific and conscious about uh, defined broadly, the politics that I put out there uh, as a creative because it's important to other people to see that. And some, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, sometimes life and death important and we might never know that. Uh, and, and I think over time, I've, be, I've come more and more to that side of being able to do that. But I think it's one of the things we'll also push folks to look at what things you may unconsciously have just not put out there without realizing it because you've, you've, you've you know, you've, you've followed the dominant culture up until now. So, um, and, and there are things that, that will get you. There will be folks who, who will stop you from getting jobs. There will be times people encourage you to quit your job, to change the way you write or what you do. Um, and like I said, that becomes the spectrum of where you have to decide where you sit on it. Reading, and that's, that's on them also, is to decide how much they're willing to embrace you, how much they're willing to knock you down, and how much they're willing to basically be your fans and supporters. Um, and mine is, I would 
rather encourage folks to be my fans and supporters because what I put out there is authentic. And that also means I also need to make sure I have those conscious decisions to, to actually put that all out there without accidentally censoring myself um, because we all do that and we may not realize it. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking and I think, I don't think I've ever professionally said that I'm an agnostic or that I don't identify as Christian before today. I, it doesn't come up to me and I, most people probably in the Carolinas looking at the old fat redneck <laughs> probably assume. Um, yeah, I've probably never said that on a panel before today. Hmm. Muzzle to have on coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Literally never considered it. <laughs> yeah. We're here for you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of ramifications. Um, my parents will not be disappointed in me. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Michael I you know <clears throat> I can think of instances when somebody was standing there at the table in author's alley with my book in their hand ready to buy it and then they said oh you're the guy from that panel and then they put the book down and walked away wow and I can think of a couple of times when that happened um, but many, many, many more times than that, I have had somebody walk up to my table and say, I liked what you said about, you know, whatever, and I want to buy your book. And so, yeah, are there consequences? And I welcome them. There are consequences, and I am delighted that there are consequences. Partly because the people who dislike me based on my politics, I don't want their money anyway. I've got a day job, um, and... Uh, you know, and I'm sorry, John, you're my publisher, but I don't want those people to think that for three bucks, they bought any part of my life. Uh, yeah, I, don't want, I don't want them to sure think that, that our official, our official account at one point last week tweeted out, if you don't like our politics, we don't want your money. Exactly. So. I, you know, should, I should say, like, here, I, though, I mean, we're, as writers, most of us are perfectly willing to take your money. Um, we just don't want to hear if you bought it to hate read. You know, like, I don't, I don't want that person to think that they have any ownership over my brain by having purchased my words. And importantly, there are really positive consequences to our politics, which is there are people who want to hear our stories, who want to see the films we make, who want to read the books we write. They want to, to leave. And we can, the consequences of our politics is that we are signaling to them that we're the folks they're looking for. And they're the folks that we're looking for. And we can make each other real happy as creators and consumers. And so there are really positive consequences that we should welcome and be excited about. I, would... I, you know, I think Michael makes a, makes a very good point in that very often the corporate side of creatives, of the creative endeavor, is always trying to say there's no market for that, right? Uh, we, we can't put that out. There's no market for that. Thinking that the market is in some ways much more conservative than it actually is. And the, prime, the, what, the most recent, uh, John probably knows what I'm about to say, but one of the most recent examples of that is Black Panther. Marvel, Marvel, Marvel uh, made Black Panther basically because uh, a part of the fandom had been saying how many movies had already come out? 20? It's like, okay, guys, when are you going to get around to kind of putting your money where your mouth is? And the inside scoop is that they really didn't think they were going to make much money off of it. They were doing it more or less to say, okay, we did it, right? Shut and up the fans. To, yeah. They wanted and, to prove the point that they couldn't make money on it. Right. So that they could use Black Panther as an excuse to never do it again. Right. And, 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 so, and then what happens? it makes over a billion dollars, right? Uh, so, you know, I think Michael is exactly right. I think that, that yes, there are, there are negative consequences, but I think in my experience, our uh, being open and honest and upfront about your politics will get you more positive consequences than, than negative ones. Uh, unless, of course, 
you are deeply, deeply, deeply problematic uh, and, and have been hiding. Uh, this goes back to that earlier point that we were making, because it's one thing to be authentically who you are and be problematic in that way up front, people have made those decisions, but it's another to be deeply, deeply problematic and have hidden it for years. And so then those consequences can be, uh, can be incredibly devastating. And let me quickly say, I love your shirt, Michael. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I was going to talk about a, one of Michael's other shirts that I bet has sold him more books than him being outspoken on panels has ever lost him because the rainbow D and D ampersand shirt. Yes. I bet you've sold a bunch of shirts off of that one. A oh, bunch absolutely. Of books off that shirt. Totally. I have had people come up to me after I wore that at a panel and said, or just walking around a con and said, like, oh, oh my God, queer science fiction with A Fallen Autumn. I went way out of my way to like write a science fiction story where uh, every relationship in it feels natural to me because every relationship in it is queer. And the perspective character is queer, the narrator, the, the, the first person perspective character is queer. And I very explicitly described it as queer science fiction. And it ended up getting picked up and talked about in places that I would never have believed would talk about a science fiction book written by somebody that they've never heard of. It was the book of the month for the gay magazine in New Orleans. It was like, they did a two page interview spread with me in a gay magazine in Atlanta. Like all these people, there are these, these folks out there who like one part of their identity they think of as not being connected to everything else, or they think that there is no market for connecting that to everything else. And then they, they see, oh, I'm a queer Star Trek nerd and the gay magazine that normally talks about the bar scene locally has an interview with a guy who wrote a gay science fiction novel and they are all about it. Like that positive consequence we always have to remember. Yeah, I um, when, when I'm hand selling that book, um, if the depending on the t-shirt that the person across the table is wearing, I either go into a lengthy description of the book and why it's fantastic, or I say, it's just a super gay altered carbon. And you know what? If they are the target audience, then they hand me $15. <laughs> yeah. And, but we have been running for a little longer than I anticipated, which shocks me not at all, given the panel that I assembled. Um, before we wrap, and I'm sorry, folks, we don't have time for questions, but if you will post those questions on the continual Facebook page, our panelists can then go in and have a conversation with you about that. And we can have a conversation there just like after a panel when we all meet up in a bar at a convention because, yeah, bring that's your own what, booze. because that's what continual is all about and yeah you'll bring your own booze just like Laura Ann does at Dragon Con <laughs> it's okay the Weston it doesn't watch this stream it's fine uh, but before we go everybody take a minute and tell the God, I always want to just break out into rent when I say this. Tell the folks at home what you're doing, Roger. But that's not the line. Um, tell everyone who's watching where they can find you online, on social media, and good God. <laughs> okay, so just read the really gay block behind Michael, and that'll... <laughs> I had it ready to go. That's beautiful. Um Tell the folks where they can find you. Um, Laura Ann? Uh, generally on social media, it's either L.A. Gilman or Laura Ann Gilman is one word. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, although Tumblr, you're also going to have to deal with all my fanish side. Oh, let's face it, the fanish side is everywhere, but especially on Tumblr. Um, and also my website, really easy to find, lauraannegilman.net. Um, e after the Ann and only one Ellen Gilman. Uh, but yeah, I, I try to keep it as, as simple as possible. It's search for my name on social media and you will find me being opinionated and cat photos. 
Yeah. Books, cats, wine, and politics. Occasional dog. <laughs> hey, what about you? Sure. If I can get this one to stop. Um, so uh, it actually is the same as my name, Dale Mohammed, only without the hyphen. So D A Y A L M O H A M E D dot com is the easiest place you can. You can find me online. I use the same thing for Twitter. Uh, and for those of you who may be history nerds, you can actually check out my film work at uh, invalidcorefilm.com. So I-N-V-A-L-I-D-C-O-R-P-S-F-I-L-M.com. And uh, it's about, uh, was it Civil War soldiers with disabilities? So, and how they saved the country. Awesome, Michael. You want to just point to things? Yeah, you can I know. Maybe Would you here, make here me there. one of those? Um, and yeah. <laughs> I will happily make you one of those. Uh, it's uh, you can find me at www.michaeljwilliamsbooks.com, or you can find me on Facebook at uh, fb.me slash author or McManley Pants on Twitter, where I am like super political. And uh, and there's where you can find me, Gerald. Uh, the easy way to find. Say again, John. How do folks give you money? <laughs> the easiest way to find me is GeraldLColeman.com. All right. And if you would like to order print copies of com and click on the link for our square store i have a couple of books up there as well so you can go to falstaffbooks.com and find out about my stuff there are links to today's books there are links to michael's books i don't yet publish anything from laura ann or from gerald but the year's still young so thank you all for joining us thank you panel i really appreciate you guys taking time out of your afternoon and sharing sharing your truth and sharing your experiences with us Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. And this is the point at which we're going to sit here as the crowd.